Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Today, we are very excited to have Dr. Kristen Palmer presenting with us. Kristen is the Director of Online Learning Programs at the University of Virginia. Um, before I turn the mic over to Kristen, I just wanted to really briefly mention a couple of things as usual. Uh, the first thing is that you're all muted during the presentation, but we do have both Q&A and chat enabled. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to use the chat and Q&A. We have Jerry Lewis and Cassidy Hall from the board helping monitor both areas. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out is that we don't have closed captioning for the live event, but we will be adding the closed captioning in post-production. Okay, Kristen, now I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to be at the Northwest eLearn Conference. Thank you for letting me participate and share some of the lessons that we've learned. Uh, compliance is not a super exciting topic. Um, however, I think some of the concepts in this, um, they should relate to just about everybody who's trying to create online learning and perhaps the story of how we started addressing some of these compliance issues uh, will help you at your institution. Um, so let me start here. Um, so first of all, who am I and why am I at Northwest eLearn? Um, I actually am, as Weiwei said, the Director of Online Learning Programs at the University of Virginia, which is in Charlottesville, Virginia. I used to live in Charlottesville, but I live in Bend, Oregon. Um, and I was super lucky and able to participate in the conference last year and just loved it and wanted to become more of this community and learn more about what, what folks are doing and share best practices. And so that's why I'm here today. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, NC Sarah, specifically the CRAC compliance. So um, NC Sarah is a reciprocity agreement that has taken hold over the last three or four years. And it's there are institutions in every state except for California that are members of NC Sarah. And you get to sign a an agreement, you get to make your provost sign an agreement every year saying, yes, we're going to comply with NC SARA requirements to be part of the NC SARA uh, reciprocity agreement. Um, so in getting your provost to sign off on that, um, there are some you know, rationale of why NC SARA and what the heck are the CRAC guidelines. So. I'll give you a minute or two to read this. This is the high level, what is NC SARA and why <laughs> should you want to participate in it? And Today, we're going to talk more about that last bullet line, stringent requirements. So what are those? Um, it's this the CRAC guidelines. And, and the first thing we did at our institution were download the CRAC guidelines. I'm going to try. Actually, um, Cassidy and Jerry, can you share these links in the chat? Actually, I say that, and I should probably do this. I'll do it. So the main CRAC guidelines are here, um, and the main homepage for NC Sarah is here. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll close that back up, and I'll go back into slideshow. So the first thing our institution did was actually look at what the CRAC guidelines were and uh, put it in a spreadsheet of what it is, what are some examples uh, that illustrate that you're compliant with the guideline, and then evidence. <laughs> and it was a great talking point. Our institution, we have 25,000 students, uh, and we have 13 different schools. We're incredibly decentralized. We have six different LMS systems that we support. Um, we have one that we, we support centrally, but we have six different LMS systems that our, our students get to use depending on what school they're in. And some schools have multiple LMS systems. So um, we're highly decentralized. There's a lot of autonomy within schools for um, 
what their strategy is, if they are developing online programs or if they're focusing on residential, if they're building graduate or undergraduate courses, if they're doing certificates or um, non-credit pathways, there's a lot of autonomy on a school level. And so at our institution, we have members from each school that are part of an online learning advisory committee. And that committee is chaired by our Vice Provost of Academic Affairs. And it is sporadic at best. Um, so we, we probably meet three or four times a year um, and try to share best practices. But we are fundamentally a residential in-person university. We're a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and the focus is, is mostly on the undergraduate residential experience specifically in our College of Arts and Sciences, which is our liberal arts school. Um, however, who our students are, we have all different types of students. And they're brilliant and on all these incredible journeys and pathways and, and some are non-traditional and some are traditional. So first step was looking at the different compliance guidelines in depth. And then, and I have three slides of what this spreadsheet looked like. And then trying to work with our online learning advisory committee and members of that committee just saying, do we do this? Uh, and the answer was a, a pretty resounding no, not centrally for most of these items. Um, in many cases, our schools that have online programs, we have seven different schools that are active in online programs and have programs that are nationally ranked they could check a lot of boxes and and we have a a satellite campus the university of virginia college at wise which used to be a community college it's in southwestern virginia and they had a whole handbook on what they did and and so they were easy for checking the boxes of yes they have all of this but uh from a central institution standpoint not so easy um so here are the guidelines in detail and um, we'll share up my slides if anybody wants to look at these and I'm happy to share. Um, I have all of this in my Google Drive, so I'm happy to share it if you're trying to figure out how to do this at your institution. Um, and there are nine guidelines here and I'll go into a screen where we can see them a little bit easier and we'll dive into each one for how we addressed it in the following slides. I can't see anyone. Are there any questions or comments or that I should address? We're good so far. Okay, thanks Wei Wei. Okay, so um, I, <laughs> I don't know if many of you have the same situation, but I got to write our recommendation paper before I got to talk to anyone because we have a, a institutional assessment uh, organization within our university. And they're like, well, what does it mean? And the intention with coming up with uh, compliant strategies for the CRAC guidelines was we'll look at the online learning advisory and we'll use that committee as kind of our, our first step for finding people that are interested in these different compliance areas and then we'll have working groups that will work together um, meeting regularly to come up with strategies for the university to be compliant and I'm a big fan of diversity and getting people, lots of different types of people um, into uh, conversations so that we can figure out the best strategy. Um, COVID sidetracked that. Um, and uh, our institutional assessment person was like, I need a solution first um, from the get-go before you start any of your work. Uh, so I created a draft document of what the uh, compliance areas, the nine areas were, the CRAC guidelines were. And then what would be opportunities to be compliant with the intention of them working on working groups. And so we launched different working groups for each area where we weren't compliant, but then they got sidetracked because of COVID. So our six areas are on the slide on the bottom, um, really looking at, you know, institutionally having some sort of statement addressing online uh, quality process. Everybody on this call should have at least one quality process because we're decentralized we have many um, there's a lot of academic freedom to choose what works for you um, an annual university review of online programs where we look at things like what are people doing for quality what are people doing for faculty development um, 
faculty resources for teaching online, online student support services, and an online student orientation. That's an institutional asset. And for others that are in decentralized uh, organizations, uh, my approach that has been successful at the University of Virginia is I create something centrally and then I can create duplicate sites or duplicate resources and then schools can customize it for their school, but they're given something to start out. An example is netiquette of here's a generic netiquette statement that's an institutional netiquette statement and then each school or each faculty member or program chair can then choose to use that resource and customize it for that or just use that resource. And so it's the same approach with a lot of the components for our compliance. Ta-da! Um, here are the different areas and we're gonna, we're gonna dive into each of these in the following slides. So um, the first guideline that there's something addressing uh, that online learning is integral in your mission. We ended up creating an institutional statement uh, in our About Us in our Online at Virginia site. Uh, it was impossible for me to have our board or our senior leadership look at adapting our main institutional mission statement. And so really what we have is an add-on at the online level rather than an institutional statement. We have had some of our schools, uh, specifically our schools active in online that have included online in their school mission statements, um, but institutionally it's in our about us. Uh, then we have also the second compliance strategy that we have um, plans for helping faculty uh, understand how to do a quality course and what does that look like? Are you gonna use like the SUNY One template? Are you gonna use um, OLC's QCTIP? Are you using Quality Matters? Um, and how are you going to sustain that institutionally so that there's uh, academic integrity there? Uh, the third, uh, for that, we, we've uh, created memberships, and I'll talk to that in an upcoming slide, and then also put out some standards that are acceptable. And we have an annual review now annually, that's what annual means, uh, with each uh, person in each school so that we can see and track where different schools are, and there's a report that's published. Um, the third guideline that there's governance and academic oversight. Fourth, uh, curricula, uh, that there's a coherent, cohesive, um, and academic rigor. This, everybody should be interested in this, right? Like, so it's compliance, but these are great standards. Um, the fifth, uh, really understanding uh, how effective programs are. The sixth, helping faculty <laughs> learn how to teach online um, and that they're qualified to teach online. I, you know, I joke, we, so we do have a School for Continuing Professional Studies. They can require uh, teaching faculty to take uh, professional development for how to teach online. But generically speaking, I can't ask a Nobel laureate to take a professional development course on how to teach online. It's just not gonna work in the culture of our institution. Um, so we have lots of uh, pool resources where faculty can go and get self-paced course, uh, self courses or job aids or instructional design support or workshops, but I can't require it for anyone. Um, then uh, seven that we have student academic ser services. So we've, we've put that in an online orientation as well as an online student services page. Um, the eighth that we're providing resources, um, the ninth, that, we're, that we have integrity in our offerings. And so I'll dive into each of these in detail. Uh, Weiwei, any questions or comments? Uh, no, but I'm wondering if you can um, elaborate on um, your professional development courses, if you don't mind, if it's a good time. Um, we can always- No, 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 I've got, I've got a whole slide on that. So we're gonna okay, get there. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to share those resources. Um, so our institutional statement, uh, this is what we did. Um, the university utilizes online learning and distance education to enhance the student access to the university programs. So it's um, not rocket science, but it's now on our online at uh, UVA 
about page and I'm gonna I should have put these in the chat earlier but we're gonna go ahead and do it um, if you go to our main online page and this is also where there are a bunch of faculty resources way way but I'll put it in the chat oh I guess I didn't put that there sorry there's that um, But so we added that statement on our about page um, and that was that was a fairly easy because I I control that domain for quality process uh, <laughs> this is this is a, I think a hard argument uh, it reminds me of the LMSs with learning analytics of how can you possibly do uh, something that will support both faculty and students um, and it's operationally efficient to have one LMS system versus six LMS systems, but it's it's just not in our culture. And uh, this is another place where that culture has deemed there's uh, you know academic freedom to choose your uh, quality process or create your own quality process. Um, uh, so we have. <laughs> Uh, institutional memberships for OLC, Quality Matters, EPSIA, um, we set uh, EDUCAUSE, and we publish out that there are these standards. We share the files uh, in, a, in an internal LMS system. We have an online teaching and learning site that has resources, including like the link to the sixth edition of the Quality Ma Matters Higher Education rubric, um, but we can't say that everybody has to use a specific type. So that's part of this annual review where we touch base within each school and find out what are they using, if they're using anything. Um, and some schools, you know, we have, we have six schools that do not do online learning. We are all doing remote teaching, um, but for schools that are, uh, I touch base with every school, uh, but not all of them are using a quality standard because not all of them do online learning. Perhaps that will change. Um, the next thing we do is we have an annual review of online programs. Um, and so this is in process right now. And it has been contentious. Our, my, our Vice Provost of Academic Affairs is has expressed frustration around compliance measures and uh, a need for uh, helping teachers teach remotely right now and that compliance is definitely on the back burner from their list of priorities and so uh, I'm not able to call a meeting with, with our whole cohort uh, due to prioritization from my boss so I'm meeting one-on-one -on -one with individuals and going through you know what are they doing for quality what are they doing for faculty development um, what kind of spaces and resources and uh, staff are available to faculty for supporting them um, and then we have a little bit of you know we do have academic programs that are what's planned what's in development what's in production um, but we're also for, for anybody else that's trying to do NC Sarah and just federal online regulations we're also asking some questions like um, what are your out-of-state <laughs> workshops internships and recruiting um, because uh, we don't really have a great systemic way to capture that and that's one of the new federal regulations of um, you know, beside the other big one that we're trying is just understanding how our accreditation programs stack up with other state accreditation requirements. So if you're doing nursing in the state of Virginia, how does that uh, meet the nursing requirements in the state of Colorado? Um, so that's one of the more difficult ones to figure out. And uh, one of the uh, federal guidelines is around tracking what our students are doing in other states. and we don't have a good system for that. So we're trying to catch that information in a few different places. And one of those places is this um, annual review and touching base with point people in each school. And 
I'm not sure how far familiar folks are with the Northeast, but Virginia, DC is about two hours north. And so we've got, you know, Baltimore, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, New York City, um, all within a few hours of commute time. And so the out of state requirements for, oh yeah, we're, we're partnered with a, a company and they're giving our students internships and their offices are in DC or Philadelphia or New York and just tracking that. Um, so not an ideal way to do that, but this is one of the places that we're catching that information. Wei Wei, this is for you. So we have, um, we have a bunch, we have a Center for Teaching Excellence, and in our Center for Teaching Excellence, there's zero people that have any education or qualifications for teaching online. And so I'm in our provost office, and so I've been working with the Center for Teaching Excellence to provide, you know, oh, there's this thing called the Community of Inquiry Framework and trying to help support faculty and staff as they're developing resources. Um, we do have a Center for Teaching Excellence site, cte.virginia.edu, um, and we have uh, I shared the link in the chat, the online at UVA page that has a page for faculty resources. This is definitely not what the ideal solution would look like and it's an area where if COVID hadn't happened, I would love to see what we would develop as a cross-functional team across the university to find out how we would do this, but that's not what happened. And so we have a faculty resources off of the online at UVA site and Right now, it's organized by uh, importance of what I think is going to be most helpful. And then we also have our, our main institutional LMS is Sakai. And so within Sakai, I have faculty resources and I'm happy to add folks to the site. Uh, I can add external people. I'll show you what that looks like. You don't have to be a UVA person to get in here. I can give you access to non-UVA folks. Is there a question or anything I can answer while I'm navigating to this? I see a QA, yeah. Yeah, there is a question. Here, I'll go in go here. Ahead, wait, wait. Yeah, there's a question from Erica. Okay, how, have you started to look at how you would enroll in the proposed regulations relating to regular and substantive interactions at the annual university review? We haven't. Um, I am fighting tooth and nail just to be able to have an annual review and having to do it on an individual basis. Um, our university, and I don't know if other folks on the call, if this will sound familiar, you know, we, we just, we assume we are, you know, we're an R1, we have phenomenal faculty, we've got amazing students, and there's this assumption of like, oh, of course we've got academic integrity, and of course, you know, our programs are wonderful, and of course we have substantive interactions because we have these wonderful faculty um, that we're not training how to teach or to teach online, but they're just super smart individuals that are doing research and publishing, and, and of course they're gonna wear many hats and be great student advisors and great teachers and great researchers and great grant writers and great, you know, there's such a long list of what faculty you need to be experts at these days. Um, and when we haven't really kind of taken that apart and tried to provide um, guidelines in different areas or support structures in different areas and, um, and, you know, we see things nationally, like Western governors getting nailed for substantive interaction, and I think they do an amazing job at how they've architected their support for students. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, there's, there's partially a, we're fantastic and we don't need to worry about this because, you know, we're, we're doing a great job producing amazing students that are going and doing amazing things. Um, and there's also partially a risk calculation of, do we think we're gonna get sued by this? How would we address this? What would it cost for infrastructure to you know excel in this area? And somebody way above my pay grade is, is in those conversations and making those decisions. Um, so that was not, uh, I'll probably hear about that answer, but um, I, don't, I don't have anything awesome to share. 
this is our collab site and so it has you know tips and templates for stay of class accessibility engaging students all sorts of different resources um, we have our rubrics and memberships which i talked about before i it's a little different view for me because i'm uh this i own the site um but if anybody wants access to that i'm happy to provide you access to that or to share what i learned in building that or what we're seeing from usage patterns so and i also offer a online virtual uh, help desk every week for an hour during lunch east coast time and i send out uh, tips on mondays and fridays to a variety of constituents at the university there's we have kind of our help desk um, mailing list we have an instructional designer mailing list uh, we have a teaching and learning with technology mailing list, an online learning and teaching mailing list. And so um, I send out tips twice a week and host office hours uh, once a week. And we have the faculty resources page and our site in our LMS. Oh, this is what I just showed you, but this is a screenshot of it. Um, this is what the faculty resource page looks like. And again, I, uh, I mentioned right now, I think the coolest thing is Zoom captions. So hopefully we're using this on the uh, with this call with the, it'll be generated afterwards by Otter AI. I'm really hoping Zoom is going to integrate Otter AI for live transcriptioning. Please, 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 because that's what they use on their back end. And oh, wouldn't it be amazing? Um, talk about a great plus one um, universal design if we could do live transcripts. Um, and then uh, the screenshot on the right is just showing you how to get to that online.virginia.edu and the faculty resources page. Uh, online support services, again, this is very school specific. And so we don't have a large uh, central footprint uh, that's consistent across schools. So if you're a law student versus a business student versus a liberal arts student, um, you're going to have different support ser services depending on what school you're in. Um, our solution, and again, this is another one where if we actually had a working team, I would hope it would look better than what it looks like, but it checks a box at the moment. Um, again, on the online.virginia.edu site, there's a student resources page, um, and it has another chart of different resources um, across the institution, along with links for every single school. So if students are within a school, they can see what resources they have within that school. We created an online student orientation that's an institutional one, and it as I mentioned earlier, this is one that we can copy and then different schools or programs or faculty can customize it based on what they want, but it has a generic infrastructure and navigation that's consistent and covers uh, a lot of really pertinent information. This is what that looks like. Um, oh, and that's it. So. I tried to go slowly, but maybe I didn't go slowly enough. Cassidy and Jerry, um, are you seeing more questions? I think we have some questions listed here. Would you like to pick one, Cassidy? Um, yeah, I'll do that. Give me one second here. Um, so uh, one of the things that I think has been happening at different institutions and I'm just curious as to whether or not it's happening there is that you know um, especially with COVID a lot of people are being asked to um, teach online that haven't had to previously right so that whole training piece is in question of whether or not they've received that training and some institutions are allowing faculty to opt out of those um, teaching reviews uh, being part of their promotion and tenure. And I was just uh, curious to find out how um, the University of Virginia is dealing with that. We're in the same boat. Um, so we have, you know, we've had lots of discussions that are above my pay grade for uh, what they're gonna, what's actually gonna happen. And uh, my boss just announced that he's leaving uh, for the UT system. Uh, so, uh, he's the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs, and so I think the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs, who's now a TBD, and our Provost uh, will be determining that, but there's been a lot of discussion at, at, at the University of Virginia around 
uh, should there be obligatory training? The answer is no. Um, and how does this relate to promotion and tenure? Um, and we've we've had for decades we've had conversations about, um, yeah, the the three legs of the stool are you know teaching, service, and research at our institution. And there was a great article, um, I think it was in the Chronicle a couple of weeks ago, where you know, a, a professor was talking about, hey, this is really what it's like, um, you know, 25 years into his career. And it's really about your research. And, and I think that's true at, at our institution. We have a, a belief that um, if you're good in your field, you're going to be able to teach it, which I don't know about that assumption. I think that assumption is, is probably flawed, uh, but that's the assumption. Um, and, and our focus while we try to do great and be good, um, it it is, I think, a traditional R1 where our focus is on research. Yeah, I, I think that's what we're seeing too. Um, the only thing yeah. we did have is, is a lot of our clinical faculty were very concerned because their um, you know, promotion and tenure more relies on their teaching. And so um, the, our institution uh, allowed you to opt out um, of any reviews on your courses from uh, the spring, the summer, and this fall. Uh, and you could already sign up to opt out of those. So I was just curious to see how that yeah. was across the board. Thank you. Well, and I don't, I don't know about other people on the call, but we had, you know, we went to pass fail in spring. And uh, we have recently implemented Blue as our student evaluation system. Um, and one of the intents of, of choosing that vendor was we could have different evaluations based on course modality. Um, not that we're that far down the path, um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of conversations about this, is this even gonna be considered because it was such a, yeah. and. And our DNA is not online. I am the only resource in our provost office that's online learning. And our Center for Teaching Excellence, there's there's no one there that has any um, formal education or certification around specifically teaching online. Um, it's We are a residential UNESCO World Heritage face-to-face -face institution. So we do have a couple of questions in the question. question oh, goody. So Mark Lentini asks, have you received feedback from NC Sara or your accrediting body about the work you've done so far? No, so we, we actually, we have a person in our compliance office who is the queen of smart sheets, if anybody uses smart sheets. And she partnered with uh, a colleague of mine who I adore, that's at uh, James Madison University. Um, uh, Sarah Chevreton, and they won a WESET award for an innovative solution to compliance. Um, and kind of having Sarah developed kind of a less techy Excel spreadsheet, and our person developed a workflow in Smartsheets. Um, so we've been recognized from WESET as a exemplary, you know, great solution to addressing compliance, but. Uh, I haven't heard anything. Chev is our uh, at accreditation body. And as I was saying earlier, I, I know my boss has been pushing on them and is frustrated with them about uh, the priorities for what the institution should be doing. And uh, that compliance checklist is uh, perceived as perhaps below the line for like actually trying to get people um, teaching effectively and helping students to learn effectively rather than uh, checking off compliance checklists. Okay, do I have successful strategies for engaging reluctant faculty? Oh, you know, I, you know, help, I, no, I do not. I think um, that the idea that I love, Oh, and Cassidy's going to answer. Oh, goody. Um, I'm going to quick share an idea that I love is, uh, I heard this at a presentation a long time ago, and we are in R1, so research is important, is pairing an instructional designer with a faculty member and then having the instructional designer author a paper on how the process went working with the faculty member and have the faculty member as a co-author so that it adds to their publication list. Um, I love that idea, but I 
Cassidy, I can't ha- wait to hear what you're going to say. Um, I was going to say that I always uh, try to connect to their research <laughs> um, because, as you said, a lot of faculty really value their research in that they know that that's where they get rewarded, right, in, in how much research they, they do and how much money they bring in. Uh, so if I engage them on their research and then connect that to their teaching, I have a lot more success than just trying to connect to their teaching. And that's just because of the way our institution operates. So I think that's a very institutional thing of whether you're a teaching institution or you're a research institution, and we're primarily a research institution, so. And I'll, and I'll add to that, because we, we're the same of, um, you know, the scholarship of teaching and learning, SODAL is having a moment right now. And so um, if you do have a Center for Teaching Excellence, like there's there's definitely opportunities to publish there and working with faculty to have what they're doing in the classroom published. Um, I do think it helps for the their CV. And then the other thing we've found, uh, we partner with Coursera for massive open online courses. And what we've told people is for grant funding requests, MOOCs are a fantastic way of disseminating your scholarship. And so for any grants that are requiring broad dissemination of the scholarship or results, um, like we're working on one right now that's a protein mapping. We have another one that's uh, increasing diversity in community colleges. Um, We found that that working with faculty to create digital assets that can be used in an online course and then specifically producing a MOOC related to it, whether it's an open or closed MOOC, um, uh, has been really valuable. I'm super curious though, especially like Jerry, since your experience, like what are motivating faculty uh, options if you're not research driven? Other than money and pizza, it depends on what school you're in. Like our business profs are not gonna show up for pizza, but our liberal arts profs will show up for pizza. Well, of course, pizza is out of the question right now. <laughs> no, Uber <laughs> Eats. Uber, I am like yeah. such a fan of having Uber Eats delivered to everybody on your team. Virtual pizza, yeah, or whatever. Uh, yeah, so, we, but like during the summer, we are paying faculty uh, up to 20 hours uh, for, for doing professional development um, in the hectic transition to remote you know, which basically fell right at the end of uh, winter quarter. And so basically yeah. uh, we had to, we pushed spring quarter back later a week. And uh, and I didn't have anything to do with it, but the instruction, instruction basically, you know, what would be the provost uh, in a big, bigger college offered, I think maybe 10 hours uh, for faculty to do professional development. And we saw actually a very heightened interest in professional development beyond just those 10 hours. You know, I mean, previously, you know, previously people would, uh, you know, we, we would get kind of a hand out, handful of people for professional development if that. And uh, there was really a lot of interest. And I think there's still, even in the summer, you know, 20 hours is is not a ton, particularly if you're taking a class or something. And, and we see people doing stuff beyond that so you know i think just this whole the whole situation has 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 gotten people thinking i need to learn some more about the stuff i should i i i totally hear you and i've had i've been on conversations where people have talked about yeah normally we've got five or six faculty and all of a sudden we have 40 faculty showing up so i've i've definitely heard stories uh similar of people are really showing up for faculty development right now. I think the other thing that we've done in the past that had mixed results that I think if we did it again would have more of an uptick is we've bought workshop passes um, for OLC so you can buy like the 10 pack of workshop passes at a discounted rate and then made them available to faculty. Um, So we've done that in the past. I wasn't able to secure financing to do that for um, this time but I think that's you know, a great opportunity for people because it is like it's OLC. It that's legit. You know, I wish I wish I could make all of our CTE faculty um, take some of those courses um, to have some formal education in online learning. Um, I have a follow up question just um, to your previous comments. 
Um, if you have faculty development opportunities during the summer, do you offer stipend to faculty? At our university, it's really uh, decentralized. So I know our continuing studies school does. Um, I know other schools do not. Uh, it's really dependent on the school. Thank you. I think the other thing that I'm, I'm very curious about, and I don't, you know, I, I feel like our faculty, um, you know, they're very self-directed and they find their own resources. And so I think a lot of faculty have a series of resources probably within their domain that they're finding through Twitter links or references from other um, peers. And uh, I'm very interested, I think it's Karen Costa has uh, the, it's kind of like an almost who, go, who are you going to call? Like you can sign up for one-on-one -on -one instructional design, you know, call when you need us support. Um, I made an argument at our institution um, and Vanderbilt has implemented this and the University of Maryland has impl implemented this where we have uh, established relationships with two uh, online program management providers that we have uh, contracts with them that you can do either fee-based services or um, uh, revenue share services, but instructional design is one of those services. And so I, I made a case that did not get funded um, to provide uh, you know, sort of on-call instructional design resources. Uh, for In our particular instance, it was through uh, OPM that we're already contracted with. Um, but I've seen, I think it's Karen Costa, um, has a service that she spun up for instructional designers on call that faculty can subscribe to that service, uh, which I just find I'm, it's going to be super interesting to see uh, how utilized those are and what the best practices are and what kind of communities of practice develop around that. And also to your earlier comment that not all colleges have online classes or offer online classes. Now with COVID, I'm just curious, what are they doing? <laughs> Well, the remote teaching. Oh, our, our university well, our university just announced last week that we're moving our move-in date for our undergraduate residential students back two weeks. So we've, we've already started bringing uh, graduate students that are working on research projects back residentially. Um, and so we're pacing things. But the announcement next, last week has now made it that uh, all of our undergraduate students are going to have two weeks of online before they're able to move into their dorm or apartment or, you know, into their dorm at the university. And then they're going to have in-person until Thanksgiving, uh, knock on wood, um, and then they're going back to remote. So, so we already know it's going to be in-person or it's going to be remote, then in-person, then remote. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's very confusing and how and so what does that mean for faculty and uh, it's definitely and we have we have some schools that are super tech heavy but they're not they don't do online learning and architecture is a great example where they use all sorts of tools um, and they're super uh, tech savvy with what they're doing but they don't do online classes and it's been really interesting to see them do remote teaching and um, really exciting on some of the interactions they've been able to have and I'm I'm hopeful you know we have some areas like our law school has a, a fantastic career services center but it it's in person in Charlottesville and you know it's kind of a one by one thing and I, I'm really hopeful that the silver lining for COVID will be hey, we can increase access and really make much higher quality services and class interactions available to more people um, using online. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that that will plant a seed at UVA, but uh, it's, it's really not our DNA. We are historical. Although uh, Thomas Jefferson founded UVA and he's quoted every single day. We call him TJ. Um, but he was very innovative in his thoughts. And so I've argued for the last decade that TJ would be very excited about the opportunities that exist with online for democratizing education and making it accessible and, and you know, enabling to have it an educated citizenry um, through reaching more people online. We'll see. So there is a question. What is the difference between remote teaching and online learning? 
Yeah, remote teaching, I think, is a lot of people going on to Zoom for three hours and, and doing their exact same lecture and not thinking at all about how on earth could I use this modality to engage students in a lot of classes that are happening that are on Zoom, that people don't have their camera on, and it's, there's just, there's, there's no benefit um, to showing up live unless the person's taking attendance. You can watch it as a recording on two times the speed with captions, and who would, yeah, you know, which would you rather do whenever you want to watch it? Um, so that's my, versus an online course where you're like asking people to check in with the chat when they get in or doing polling questions or small group discussions or annotating a slide together for, hey, what's your muddiest point? Let's annotate a slide together anonymously and I'll then talk to that point. So, so the remote really, it, it, it's, it's basically, many of those classes that were just thrown into, okay, you were face-to-face, -face, but now you have to be online. I think there's probably a, 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 a spectrum, you know, right. uh, like, like you described the ones that are, that are basically just, you know, okay, we got we to gotta do this remote now, so we're going to just give our lectures. But what we're seeing is that people are in you know, even the people who are thrown into that, a lot of them are incorporating the online tools. It's just that it's a, it's a process, you know, it's not something that's going to happen right away for a class that had two weeks to switch from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Yeah, Another, I, be I believe our number at UVA was 4,265 courses. So, yeah. and, and we do have, I think, a challenge that we're going to have is in spring, we started, we are on a semester base at the at UVA, and and so everybody knew who their students were from face-to-face -face interactions. And, and so I've really been pushing the importance of building community and, you know, posting intro videos and figuring out how you can do small groups early so that peers can get to know each other, the instructor can get to know who the students are. Um, that, I think, is, for folks that are not thinking about that, uh, fall is going to be incredibly painful. And it is also common to see a mix of using remote and online. You may have instructors who are teaching um, real time, remotely on Zoom or other conference software using other conference software, and at the same time also have asynchronous offline. Well, I shouldn't say offline, not real time discussions on the LMS or through other platforms. So it's going to be very flexible, and and I. I heard another new name um, for a mixed method would be um, high flex, right? Hybrid flexible. So I it just, gets I'd seen like confusing. we talked a little bit about high flex before the, before the webinar started. And I just am like, oh, that's the, I think that's the scariest option just because it's so much work. And um, really, I argue that we are not supporting our faculty and we're not supporting our students enough as it is, and you look at supporting both modalities, um, it really requires an infrastructure investment. And I don't know if anybody, uh, you know, on this call has had, hey, this really worked for me and I was able to do this. Um, but I look at institutions that have hundreds of people supporting faculty and students. I'm like, okay, you can try it. But if you don't have really robust systems for student support and faculty support, I think that's just a, a non-starter talking a high flex model. So I'll consider distance education. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was part of our moving to high flex. Um, you know, people are still very nervous about it, but there were several steps that were taken. One of them was to take, um, I think, 43 of our rooms on campus that didn't have technology at all and quickly put technology in them so that they can, um, you know, be used as uh, classrooms that connect live to other students at a distance. Um, our high flex is having half the students there at a time and the other half of the students, the next class or however the professor 
it intends to do that, but then they do have the option of connecting online fully if they want to. So um, yeah, that idea of flexible, flexible is definitely the key here. And um, we're also hiring um, a bunch of teaching assistants and people who can be in those classrooms to help those faculty through the process. So, And that, I think, will make it more successful, right? Having that, we did a, a report a few years ago on uh, inventory of uh, people, places, and, um, you know, staff support and, and resources for, you know, cameras, studios, audio studios. And what we found, which was kind of an aha, but in retrospect, it's like, yeah, that makes sense, was if you have resources, but you don't staff them to be supportive, nobody uses them. And so we have studios where there is somebody that's there all the time that can help you that is utilized 110% and people are trying to fit in when they can get into that studio. Studios that, you know, there's a student worker at the front desk who maybe can come when there's nobody else at the front desk can help you. That studio is empty um, pretty much all the time. So I think, I think having that support infrastructure and coming into it saying, yeah, we need, you know, T we need to hire somebody that's going to take notes and we need somebody that can monitor the chat and we need, you know, there's a process for raising to the faculty member what the questions are on the chat. Um, those kind of basic setting it up to be successful will, will really make a difference in the student and faculty experience. And I, I put up our virtual backgrounds. We've got, um, We've we've got we've got some test classrooms and have done some, you know, remote participants with face to face, where we're not requiring face to face people to have um, laptops, uh, and just trying to figure out how that works. And you know, cloth masks, you can hear your th and th better than, or paper masks, you can hear those sounds audio quality better than um, cloth masks. And you know, having the the big name so people can see who you are if you're remote and faculty can see who the student is easily. Uh, so we have a Zoom background generator. If anybody wants that link, I'll happily send it to you. It's UVA colors, but. And there's a great okay. comment from Erica yeah. about distance yeah. education and yes. So Jerry, I cut you off. Sorry about that. Well, I was just going to, I was actually just going to read Erica's comment. Although I guess everybody can see it. So she says, I think it's important to remember that in terms of the Department of Education, our accreditors at NC SARA, this is all considered distance education. So I mean, remote, you know, online, yep. Yeah. And again, it's a, it goes back to that question of, you know, I think we tend to look at it as a risk, you know, what are your priorities and uh, are you worried about compliance or are you like boots on the ground trying to get stuff to work in classrooms and, um, and where are your resources? We do not have enough resources to cover everything. Um, and I, I, I wonder what different folks on the call are. I think I would assume community colleges because there's such I feel like 10 years ahead of everybody else with, you know, adopting quality matters or, you know, having quality guidelines. I wonder if, you know, it's yet another area where community colleges are way advanced compared to in other institutions like ours. Um, and Kristen, um, looking at the clock here, we have seven minutes left. I'm just wondering, since you touched a little bit on academic integrity, um, if you could speak briefly um, to how do you ensure academic in integrity in your online exams, assessments, um, how do you approach that? So it's, it's like super messy, right? So I think, so my own research um, is on, you know, my my research has been on what residential students do in online classes and versus what their perceptions are. And one of the things in my research, it found that no student watched every single class video and almost every student gamed the quizzes to learn the content. And I think, I think there's just a fundamental shift in you know, you cannot take uh, where there's going to be one midterm and one final 
approach to assessment if you're in online learning. It just, it, it's low stakes, frequent assessments. Um, we've had, we have proctored options that we've negotiated uh, university-wide agreements for, and I would not recommend them. For, you know, like I, the vendor people are all very nice. It is creepy. It's a, it provide, it's, a creepy experience for students and it's a lot of uh, work on, for faculty and you know I think there's a fundamental shift in how we look at demonstrating learning and um, when we're talking about online and and there are tools out there like proctoring to try to keep with the same we're going to do a midterm and final and it's going to be proctored um, and it's just disastrous I think it really needs to be you know, you have to start from a backwards design of what are the concepts, how can we do formative assessments, how can we provide opportunities for students to behave as they want to behave to learn, and in my experience, it's, you know, they want to game quizzes, they want to have, um, you know, social connection with each other in small groups, they want to have real-world problems that they're um, applying whatever they're learning to those real-world problems, um, and and those are some of the just basics of how people learn, right? So I think there are tools that are more of a direct translation and I, and I don't recommend them. Thank you so much, this is very helpful. And I totally agree with you. <laughs> I think it's just, uh, it's, a, it's going to be a long process to make the change because it requires faculty to rethink their assessment and possibly redesign the courses and, and align the assessment with the course goals and all things. And all their free time while they're negotiating like 20 other hats of writing for grants and doing research and publishing and advising students and maybe being a parent with somebody who's tiny that needs help in the background. It's a lot of work. Um, so. so Tamara Becker asked for a link to your Zoom generator. Oh, oh, okay. I'll actually put that in the chat while we're here and then it's there forever. And she also says, this is really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> As Kristen's getting the link, any last minute comments or questions? I just want to make sure that all the questions are answered. And I'm happy to follow up with everyone if anybody wants more information or share resources. I think one of the things I love about higher education is the transparency um, and willingness to share best practices and um, resources. And so I'm happy to share any of the resources we've created. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead and paste your email in there too. Oh, excellent. Okay, yeah. Such a good idea. Okay, I'm gonna copy it for everybody. Okay, we are almost at hour. Thank you so much, Kristen, and everyone for um, engaging in this conversation. Um, we're going to close the session now, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and you have Kristen's email. You can reach out to um, Jerry, Cassidy, and I as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye.